today on the show, we have Melissa Robena. Melissa Robena is the Chief Operations Officer for the Center of Appreciative Inquiry, an international leadership development organization. For over 10 years, Melissa has worked with individuals, clients, and communities worldwide using Appreciative Inquiry to enhance and enrich engagement, dialogue, innovation, connectivity, and sustainable change. Melissa, so glad to have you here on the show today. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to be having this conversation with you today. So for the audience's context, Melissa and I, I think we connected online late last year and then kind of reconnected a little bit earlier this year. And, you know, I followed a lot of your work with Appreciative Inquiry, as well as your podcast, Pivotal Moments. And I think we share a lot of the same types of values in terms of wanting to learn and grow from a communication, communication lens in terms of hearing other people's stories, learning what it is that they're perceiving through their own lens, through their own perspective and seeing ways in which, ah, maybe there's another way I can actually, you know, approach situations in my life, given these different stories and perspectives others have. And specifically when it comes to your professional life, being someone who's a master communicator, having been a director of communications, um, n- now a chief operations officer at Center for Appreciative Inquiry and working on so many different communicative means and seeing how you've been able to then transfer that into your personal life and just how that's been able to emanate out into other facets of your life. And so today I'm really excited to be chatting with you to learn how to have authentic conversations in all facets of your life, given that, and we'll touch on it a little bit here, that communication can sometimes be compartmentalized, can be very nuanced in different facets and arenas of our life. And, and so I, I, I love it, Melissa, to start off, you know, how did you get first interested in both, I guess, one, storytelling and two, communications at large? I actually was a finance major in my undergraduate. I really was very comfortable with numbers because, you know, I could, they were consistent. I could rely on them. Anytime you are dealing with people, you know, everything varies. You have to be mindful and pathetic. Um, Just speaking in terms of, you know, different communication styles, which you mentioned, which was like in my personal life, I, I, oh, anytime in your personal life, I, I would, I would compartmentalize like you mentioned. Um, And I think that that stems from one, just growing up in a household where it was very tumultuous. Shortly after my parents divorced, um, you know, my mother was healing from a very traumatic divorce. I mean, my father was the love of her life. My father quickly found, you know, other women. So I felt disregarded. No one asked me, hey, Melissa, how are you feeling right now? Mm -hmm. I was never really engaged. Um. in in dialogue. And so I often tell people that I was a silent sufferer. And um, so I didn't want to burden my, you know, anyone by sharing my feelings. Um, So I would keep it to myself. And I was very good at that. Um, In my professional life, it was, it was almost like a stark contrast. And I think that that stems from the fact that, you know, you hear the saying work is work and, you know, you leave Mm -hmm. your personal business at the door. And so I was very I, I love that. No one was asking me how I was feeling, even if it was like a shitty day. Um, so I wasn't required to express or share my my emotions or feelings. And I could easily reply to clients um, or craft proposals without having to share that vulnerable side of myself. Mm-hmm. Um, coming into the work of appreciative inquiry. So appreciative inquiry is all about looking at the strengths we possess individually and collectively and basically inquiring into how can we best utilize those strengths to create either organizational change, individual change. And I remember when I first started with the Center for Appreciative Inquiry, I was the social media specialist. So I was, you know, sending out all the tweets and Facebook posts, but I really didn't understand what appreciative inquiry was until my boss actually invited me to participate in one of their trainings. So I went through the training and it was such a stark contrast to what I was taught. And what I mean by that is, especially in finance, you are taught to look at what's not working. Mm -hmm. Um, As a 
finance person, I'm trying to figure out as a client, how can I minimize your risk? If, especially if you're investing in stock, I want to minimize your risk. So I'm looking at what potentially could go wrong. In appreciative inquiry, it's almost the opposite. I'm looking at, you know, even though this situation might be shitty, what is one thing that you, we can celebrate, that we can highlight? And I remember just sitting in this training thinking like, this is bizarre. <laughs> um, and it, but I mean, it's just because it was in stark contrast to what I'd been taught all my life. And it took me a very long time to make this shift. And what I mean by that is so after the training, you know, oftentimes people will go out and they're going to conduct these, like what we call appreciative inquiry sessions in their department. Well, I was just a social media marketing specialist. So I was thinking, okay, well, what is my sphere of influence? What could I do? So I started to look specifically at the words I was using in my emails and my social media posts and thinking about, is there another way to write this? Um, at first I grappled with, you know, God, and you know, by reframing it, I'm changing what I'm saying, but it's actually, I'm not changing what I'm saying. I'm just changing how I say it. Mm -hmm. And I found that by changing my words that, you know, to ones that were more affirmative or life-giving, the, the relationships that I was building were actually strengthening, which I thought was fascinating considering, you know, most of these people I'm never going to meet. So how do you develop a relationship with individuals through a digital space? And I found that by changing the words that I used in my correspondence allowed me to easily do that. Yeah, no, I think for the correspondences that we've had, I've even felt that myself. I'm like, whoa, wait, am I like in a room chatting with Melissa? It, because there's a very stark contrast in the way I think the way, like you mentioned, the word choice that you you come in with through your correspondence, whether that's through email, some sort of instant messaging platform, whatever the case may be, you can really tell the amount of thought and and effort that goes into it. And I think like you mentioned, it's that reframing that new perspective on how does in a digital means, in a digital world, if I may potentially never get to meet this person, how can I still make it feel as if I'm there in that room with that individual, making them see, feel, feel as if they being seen, uh, being felt as if they're being seen or being heard. And, you know, that's just such a wonderful thing that, you know, you, Melissa, have in terms of the way that you're, you communicate. And I want to touch on, I know we were able to touch a lot here on the professional aspect. I know, like you've mentioned throughout our correspondence offline that there was kind of a, a gap in terms of how you went about communicating, feeling as if you were a master communicator in the professional realm, just being able to, you know, have some sort of structure, I guess, to the way in which you communicate. But then in your personal and home life, there was a little bit of a disconnect in the way that you would, you would communicate with others. How did you find that gap between the two worlds influence the way you navigated your own self-identity and the way that you communicated within your own self? Excellent question. Uh, the biggest one for me was probably counseling and that I, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of mental health. Um, a lot of the reason why I was suppressing my communication or my feelings was due to past pain, previous pain. And I was carrying that forward into my relationships with my spouse, family members, friends. So you know, I went to counseling and obviously in there, we did a lot of inter introspective questions. Um, I think the biggest aha moment for me was, you know, basically like kind of turning the tables and looking at myself and saying like, how am I contributing to the dysfunction in the relationship? And I'll take my, my relationship with my husband, I'll show it as an example. So we were almost um, on the brink of divorce and I was very frustrated with the fact that I felt as if he wasn't listening to me, that, you know, anytime problems would arise, that I was the one that would, you know, swoop in and take care of it. And it's, you know, this happened, you know, 10, 14 plus years. And I'm thinking to myself, well, gosh, if I'm going to feel alone, I might as well just be alone. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't really look into the role that I played into the relationship, which is, you know, growing up, um, I was a people pleaser. I was the caretaker, especially after my parents divorced. Um, my parents, like I mentioned earlier, were kind of like into their own thing. So I felt it, you know, being the eldest that I needed to take care of the younger kids. And so anytime there was a problem, I would 
fix it because I didn't want it to then transfer to my parents who were already kind of just had a lot on their plate. So this um, role um, carried on with me from childhood into adulthood. And so my dynamic with my husband, it was anytime there was a problem, I would sweep it or sweep, you know, swoop in and, and try to fix it. But yet I would get upset when something would happen and he wouldn't fix it himself. Mm. But that's because I taught him. And that's the thing is you teach people how to treat you. And so I taught him that anytime that there was an issue, it's okay. Cause Melissa is going to swoop in and get it when, when really I wanted him to take accountability. So I was actually stepping in my own way. Um, so when I realized that about myself, I was able to kind of step back from the situation and allowed him to kind of step forward, empower him to, to make the, the tough decisions to, to take action. And when I did that, yes, it takes a lot of trust in order to trust that that person's going to step up and not to say that it, it went smoothly. I mean, there's obviously anytime you switch the dynamics within any group, um, there's going to be some uncomfortableness, some, you know, they're mm -hmm. trying to figure out like, what, what are these new boundaries you're establishing? And right. that's really what it was, right? I was establishing new boundaries, but I was, you know, pleasantly surprised when, you know, something would arise and he stepped, he stepped up to the plate he, because he was fully capable. Um, but in that though, so, you know, in addition to doing the introspective questions, I think that, you know, anytime you're making any sort of change, whether it's in your communication or your relationship, any sort of change, I tell this to clients all the time is change isn't going to happen overnight. You're going to have to learn and unlearn a ton of stuff along the way. You're going to have to give yourself grace when you, you know, slip up because there are going mm -hmm. to be slip ups, especially when things get hard. And the reason that is, is because when things get hard, we revert back to our old behaviors, something that we know will get us through those hard times. Um, but knowing that that self-awareness then pops in and say, okay, this action, this behavior no longer serves me, but what does serve me now? And then to develop new strategies that are in better alignment with where you'd like to go and who you'd like to be. Yeah, no, that's such a, such a true point in terms of us always reverting back to what it is that we know. A lot of this communication style, learning to I guess, close that gap, learning the habits that you had when it came to your communication style is, I guess, more so a matter of the fact of unlearning all these different habits, these different patterns that you've subconsciously trained yourself. And yeah, like you mentioned, it's a, it's a scary type of territory to navigate because it's like, oh, there's all these feelings that have been that are surfacing up that have been hidden away in these, you know, spider web cops for so many years. And then you're like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. I didn't, I didn't sign up for this. I thought this was going to be like, you mentioned something that would take, you know, a couple of days, maybe a week or so. And then we'd be like, oh, it's okay. It's all good. But no, it takes a lot of time. And yeah, it's just such a scary thing to embark on. It does take a lot of time. And I think the biggest thing, especially for being a type A person like I am, it's like, well, what do you mean I failed? And it's really hard because I don't have patience is definitely not a virtue I possess. So the fact that change takes time can be very frustrating. But when, and this is what I tell clients a lot, and I try to remind myself of is, is that you're never going to rarely, shouldn't say never, rarely does a goal or something that you're going for be achieved overnight. It's these, a series of small steps, small imperfect actions that will get you there. And so it's so important to celebrate these small wins along the way, because before you'll, you know it, you'll turn around and you, you'll have gone, you know, a mile or accomplished mm -hmm. whatever it is that you've wanted to accomplish. So celebrating those small wins is crucial. Yeah. And it's funny because as you progress on forward, it becomes more so, oh, I like these small, small little wins I, I'm accomplishing. You. And then you're like, oh, I reached the goal. And then you're like, oh, I want more. I want to continue to change. It's just a, a domino effect from there. So I love that. And, and, and so, you, you know, we touched on it a little bit earlier also about how communication is different in home life versus professional life, given the way I think we mentally kind of perceive how are we going to approach this situation. There's, I feel as if in a professional setting, there's a little bit more 
boundaries and structures already set in place in terms of understanding the dynamics, whereas in our personal lives, they're a little bit more gray. They're not as well defined like you mentioned, and you have to be able to set those boundaries to gain what it is that you want, seek out the intention that you want out of those personal relationships. And so from from your time and experience exploring both the personal and professional worlds, your identity with respect to both of them, how you communicate in a personal setting versus a professional setting, what are the types of qualities and beliefs you found have best served you to communicate authentically and how that has been able to spill out into all facets of your life? The first one I would say would probably be self-awareness. And you touched about uh, on it a little bit when, when we're talking about establishing boundaries. So, you know, being self-aware allows me to really identify the emotions, feelings, and beliefs that I have. And through that clarity, I'm able to figure out or determine what those boundaries are for myself. And I've learned that if I don't determine what those boundaries are, someone else is going to set that for me. And so I think it's, it's crucial to be able to be self-aware enough in terms of defining that. But then also, if you find yourself in relationships where the boundaries have already been defined for you and it's not feeling right, it's not in alignment with your values, then I think that's where it's like you spend attention to, okay, is this relationship worth saving, Um, whether it be a, a personal or professional relationship? And if it is, then what can I do to engage in conversation that will help redefine those boundaries so that they're co constructed, so that they're shared? And that it's a win-win for both parties involved. Um, Another thing that I struggled with, that I still struggle with, is self-worth. And that, you know, self-esteem is not self-worth. So self-esteem are thoughts like, okay, I think I'm pretty or I am smart or funny or whatever. Self-worth is a belief. So, and that has to mean that, you know, I am more than all of these things. That I am more than just being smart. And so the difference between, you know, a thought and a belief is that think about how many thoughts run through our head every day, Mm -hmm. right? But not any one thought can really hold power over us, except those thoughts that become beliefs. So beliefs are basically thoughts that we make real or accept as true. And for the longest time, um, I didn't feel that my voice was worthy enough to be heard or spoken. Um, again, coming back to that, you know, silent suppressor or silent sufferer. Um, once I have surrounded myself with good friends, done work through counseling, I found that my voice matters and, you know, as uncomfortable as it is, I mean, here I am talking with you, I'm using my voice, which I would have probably silenced before. And here I am amplifying it and you're providing the space for me to talk about it. So Slowly through little acts, I'm starting to build that self-worth that, you know, I am worthy. I am what I have to say matters. Um, And then lastly would probably be something kind of what we've talked about before, which is this mindful practice. Um, So change, especially if I want it to be long lasting and sustainable, it's going to take time that I'm going to mess up, that it's going to be a progress, you know, um, not to beat myself up if and when should say when those mistakes happen. Um, But again, coming back to celebrating the small wins, that is huge for me. Huge. Especially when I look at myself uh, a year ago before the pandemic or even last month. I mean, who I was then is not who I am now. I'm constantly evolving and progressing into the person I want to be. Yeah. I think these small wins, that idea of progressive evolution is really a key quality to help serve you in this journey of wanting to communicate more authentically, find that power in your voice, find that that self-worth, like you were mentioning, that empowerment in your voice, in your story, in the form of expression that you feel most comfortable expressing yourself with. And it, it's a difficult, it's a difficult process, I think, because the way in which, and I think a lot of it comes to like digital, digital mediums in terms of how quick things can get done. And you feel pressured by that kind of environment to get things fixed in a much quicker manner. When in reality, communication, regardless if it's digitally done or if it is verbally over, you know, still doing it over a digital medium here, but still it's not something that can be, like you mentioned, at the flip of a switch, 
completely revamp. Like I remember myself, like we were just chatting earlier about how this podcast for me has been able to help empower myself as well. Like you mentioned, Melissa, finding power in your voice and learning how to communicate. And it doesn't come all in one go. It takes those small little wins. And like you mentioned, being mindful with those small little wins, you have to always think we have these tendencies. Type A people have tendencies of, oh, I took three small wins, you know, in the last week. And then, oh, one small little setback. That small little setback is, you know, the equivalent of 10 small wins. And we beat ourselves up over that. So definitely being mindful is super important. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm just, I'm listening to you talk and I'm just thinking, you're right. Like if I had three small wins this week and only one last week, or maybe I had one setback, it's almost like it null and voids all the progress that I've done because I'm only fixating on, on the negative. And that's something okay. that I'm trying to work on. Yeah. And I think taking that from the, the thought of that negative belief versus turning it into a be- into a belief, like you were mentioning, the difference between thoughts and beliefs. Oh, I'm fixating on this, but I'm not choosing to believe that that is the definition of what my the outcome of my week looked like. So I think, I think, yeah, that was a great point you hit on the difference between the thought and the belief. You'll have, I think, it's like you have millions of thoughts every day, like ten, tens of millions of thoughts, but beliefs, those are f- much fewer to come by. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just, a million thoughts in my head all day. I mean, that's, and probably as a type A, I'm sure many people experience this where it's hard to like turn, turn your brain off. Right. (laughs) So so I'm I'm curious, you know, having been able to practice all of, or go through this journey and be able to incorporate these different practices going through counseling, going through this mindful practice, experiencing the small wins and learning to appreciate and enjoy them. You know, what are some other strategies or practices you found helpful for yourself to continue communicating authentically without compartmentalizing it like maybe you had prior as well as also just continuing to evolve, never feeling as if you're also completely done with your own empowerment and finding the empowerment within your voice and the way in which you communicate? The first one would be positive reframing. Um, I know we just talked about how, you know, the old Melissa probably would have fixated on all the losses and not all the small steps and small wins that I've made. Um, When I work with clients, it's very easy for clients to tell me what it is that they don't want. But if I flip the script and I ask them, well, what is it that you would like more of? they often pause because no one has asked them that question before. And so Mm -hmm. this is something that I've seen even in my personal and professional life, which is um, like, say, if I get into an argument with my, my spouse, it could say like, you never listen to me. Um, What if, but when you peel that back, um, you never listen to me. It's more of like, I want to feel connected to you. So it could be like, you know, I feel most connected to you when we dedicate time to talk Uh, during dinner, I seem to have the best conversations with you then. And when you're practicing that positive reframe, again, it gets reinforced with the the words that we use. And so in appreciative inquiry, we have this saying that words create worlds. And that's based off of the theory of social constructionism, where every interaction, every show you watch, every article you read is slowly constructing your reality and your um, understanding of the world around you. And when you think about the importance of your words and the conversations you have with others using this frame of of reference, wow, our conversations are extremely important. So to be very mindful of the words that we're using. So if we go back to the example that I have of where you never listen to me, when if someone were to say that to me, you know, Melissa, you never listen to me. Immediately, that makes me feel that um, maybe I'm a Make me, make me feel or believe that maybe I'm a failure as a friend, as a, as a wife. And I immediately would become defensive. I might start to shut down and compartmentalize or avoid the conversation altogether. When we're reframing and we're being more mindful of the words that we're using. So instead of saying, you never listen to me and, you know, changing it slightly to, you know, I feel most connected to you when, Mm -hmm. if someone were to start that uh, sentence like that now, that elicits a different emotion in me. Now I feel valued and needed. And as a result, I would be more 
open to engage in dialogue that would allow me and that other person to explore how might we more, create more opportunities to connect. So through all of that, that helps provoke, you know, positive reframing and the words that we use help provoke action and build that connection that we all see, especially now during the Rona, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I, I love that being able to, yeah, like you mentioned when, with that example with the client, always asking or rather them never hearing what is it that you need more of that I think is such a quick, simple flip of the switch type of, or rather looking at it from the opposite side of the coin, but it's not done as much as it should be. And it's, it's funny because I think then people start realizing, and I think this whole pandemic has kind of broadening it out, has also kind of done the same type of effect where it's like, oh, I never have thought about what I really want out of a relationship, a conversation with others, my own career. And when you reframe it that way versus what is it that's missing or what is it that's taking away from, from this experience? You're always focusing on the negative and being able to focus more so on the positive reframing, like you mentioned, and being able to instill that as a belief as a result of small wins, small incremental actions of reframing. Okay, here's one time I can reframe. Here's another area of my life I can start re positively reframing. And then it builds up into your entire being, the entire way you approach things is completely changed because of those small little, small little incremental steps. And what I've learned Again, when I talked about being a finance major, it was a completely new concept to me. And so when I started to change the words that I was using in my email, over time, those words started to become part of my verbal um, communication. Mm -hmm. And eventually those verbals turn into action. So you slowly start to, these like become habits. And over time, they, they just, you begin to embody this and you'll just, it comes easier the more you practice it. Yep, it definitely does. It definitely does. So for all the listeners and viewers, I think this conversation we've been having has been such a great conversation to help you learn how to have more authentic conversations in your relationships in life, whether that's professionally, that's personally with a spouse, with a friend, you know, whoever it may be, being able to incorporate all of these things that Melissa and I have been speaking on in terms of you know, these small little wins, being mindful, understanding that sometimes you need to co-own the boundaries in a relationship and not always feeling as if you're at effect of someone else's boundaries. Um, or similarly, if you're imposing the boundaries, being able to co-own it together. And, you know, with these practices that Melissa's mentioned with like counseling, with deep self-introspective work, I think you're really going to help everyone and it's a constant evolution. Like we mentioned, I don't want to come across, and I think Melissa, you'd agree as well, that this is not like a one and done overnight. Oh, I'm a master communicator. Like if you look at a ranking board, no, we're always just like, we're all floundering around trying to learn how to communicate better. Cause, and, and I think once we realize that communication is so powerful, it, it's just such a beautiful journey to continue embarking on learning better ways to communicate. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so what I like to do at the end of each and every single one of my episodes, Melissa, is this final segment called the three keys to relationships. And so this is a fun little segment where I ask guests three questions to kind of gauge their own insight and philosophy around relationship management. And these pertain to any and all relationships. So with your friends, family, your spouse, romantic partner, business colleagues, what have you. And these aren't quick fire questions either as well. So I'd love to hear you expand. And so, and so the first question I have is, what's your number one relationship red flag? Funny enough, it's lack of communication. <laughs> um, and, and that's because, and I'm just speaking from my personal experience. So my husband and I, we've been together for 14 years, married five. But I remember before we got married, or actually probably a little after, someone asked me about his retirement plans or his anything. And if you asked me anything about my husband, I wouldn't be able to tell you, you know, uh, we never really talked about kids. We, I mean, it was just astounding. If some, if I had heard this, if I was having a conversation with a friend of mine that said, no, I didn't even, I've never asked my husband these things. I'd be like, what are you crazy? Yet here I was engaging in that. And it was because no one likes to talk about finances. No one likes to talk about children. Cause you know, what if he doesn't want them? And I do and find it. it but because of that, because we didn't talk, 
there was no way that any sort of relationship could be could be built because relationships in order to grow i believe communication is the foundation of it all and if you can't communicate how can you build anything that's going to withstand any sort of trials and tribulations you can't you can't co-construct any sort of boundaries you can't evolve together what ended up happening between he and i was we were basically living independent of one another and and that's not how any marriage should be or any partnership should be. It should be working together as a team, understanding that, you know, the strengths might be the weakness of another and how you might best work together. But you, you're never going to find that out unless you engage in those difficult conversations, which mm-hmm. is something that he and I did not have until, you know, we were talking about divorce. And even then, you know, we had to basically go to, uh, marital counseling to have a third party kind of just because here you ha- you had two people that were violent sufferers that did not feel comfortable being vulnerable and expressing themselves. You now like that is what is needed to save this. So it was nice having someone there to kind of walk us through um, because some of the conversations got kind of hairy. And so having another person there to walk us through was crucial. But I, as a result of that, I've definitely had a lot more respect and admiration from him because now I understand, you know, maybe why he reacted in a certain way and, you know, something that might've upset me before. Now I have empathy for it, which I may not have had earlier. So communication is key. Yeah, no, I think this has been such a running theme throughout this entire podcast of how communication, like you mentioned, is the foundation for, um, a solid relationship. It won't necessarily solve everything, but you can't really start off with anything good when it comes to relationships with a lack of communication. So I completely agree. And so the second question I have is what's the, in as a converse to that, what's the most underrated relationship quality in your opinion then? I would have to say emotional intimacy. And this goes, this is, this can be applied either to your personal or professional life. I know anytime we use the word intimacy, we often think, you know, husband, wife, spouse, partner, whatever, Mm -hmm. but it basically involves any sort of candid or authentic sharing of your thoughts and feelings and being able to tell another person, some of your biggest fears, your, your dreams, your disappointments. Um, and I think as a result of that, by being emotionally intimate with someone, at least for myself, is when I've had those moments with individuals, I felt as if I was seen and understood. And as a result of that, um, I was able to build trust, respect, and admiration. And one of the things that I've also learned is that when you are starting to become emotionally intimate with someone, um, you know, you're becoming vulnerable, that breaks down walls that that other person may have had up. And Mm -hmm. they're seeing that you are basically bringing out like an olive branch, and they start to feel safe and comfortable to be vulnerable with you. And so when you have two individuals that are vulnerable with one another, the bond, the communication, it's so enriching, it's so meaningful, it's so powerful, that you're like, well, why didn't I start this sooner? (laughs) But Um, absolutely. I think emotional intimacy being vulnerable is, is probably one of the most underrated relationship qualities that I think we just don't pay attention to, or, you know, because being vulnerable is extremely scary. Yeah. I can talk to you. We can talk about, I can tell you my retirement plans. I can, you know, but now if you're asking me to be vulnerable now, I'm now I'm afraid this is going to come across as me being weak when actually being vulnerable is actually a, a sign of strength. And so when you have two people that are willing to be vulnerable with one another, I think that shows probably the greatest level of trust that you can have with another person. Yeah, it definitely does. You, you're, you're giving way to so many different dark corners of what's going on in your mind. And you're essentially, like you were saying, allowing someone to use that information and and kind of put you down or further put you down into that dark hole. But if they can then lift you up and that creates that amount of trust, that amount of admiration, and then 
that relationship continues to flourish from that point. And I think kind of touching on, like you mentioned, emotional intimacy is more so thought of in a personal uh, setting rather than professional, but in a professional setting, it's huge. You can, I've seen it plenty of times when, you know, someone's working with a manager and a manager is always as if, oh, I have to have everything, you know, all put together. I can't show any sign of weakness because then my team is going to be like, oh, it, things are in disarray, you know, the boss doesn't have it under control. When in reality, everyone is still trying to figure it out. Everyone has, and, and it's also, I think, a, a result of us putting our personal lives, you know, once we enter the office space, it's, it's behind us, you know, we don't bring that in. But, you know, office life can be affected due to personal, personal circumstances and being like, oh, I'm, you know, not having a great day today because of, you know, something's going on personally, or, you know, even at work, oh, I don't really know how to, manage this particular, you know, project or this particular situation that we're going through, it causes me a little bit of anxiety. And then in reality, you, you just be, are able to develop a much better kind of co-working relationship. Absolutely. And I, I used to think that, you know, my personal life had to be kept at the door, but if I'm wanting to be authentic, not even with just clients, but my colleagues, I need to bring my full self because we're all human. We all have good days. We all have bad days. And I've probably, this has probably been reinforced, especially during the Rota when, you know, people are working from home and, you know, kids are walking in life is life. And I think that this has allowed us to be more empathetic with one another. And I know for myself that even during the Rona, I've gotten closer with my colleagues, but that's just because we've all brought our full self, our personal and our professional into the conversation. And you know, the work that we've been able to produce as a result of it, because I'm no longer compartmentalizing, I'm being able to be my full self, Mm. my productivity, my level of engagement, all of are higher as a result of me being my full self. There you go. Perfect example. Perfect example of bringing your full (laughs) authentic self to work. And I, I hope, yeah, like this whole pandemic is going to allow individuals to feel more safe and more comfortable to do that. And so the third and final question I have is what would you say is your own mantra or slogan? Or if you don't have one, maybe what would be that for relationship management? Or we can expand it to life at large as well. Ooh. Um, probably something that really resonated with me. I saw it like on Instagram somewhere, but it's it really rings true for me, which was something like difficult conversations may hurt the person you're talking with, but not having those hurts you. And I've learned that, especially as a people pleaser, I was always wanting to make sure that, you know, everything I was doing was for someone else, that their feelings were never hurt, but I can't control another person's emotions. So if I'm having to fire someone or I'm wanting to break up with someone, of course, they're going to be hurt. That's the, that's natural, but I can't control that. And I would take that on as myself, you know, for myself. And, you know, I would either, you know, extend, you know, the relationship longer than it needed to be because I was afraid of having those conversations. But by not having those conversations, in the end, I was hurting myself because I was unhappy. And so, you know, yeah, uh, difficult conversations may hurt the person you're with, but not having them will hurt yourself. Yeah, that is, I'm kind of just reflecting even myself and thinking about how true that statement does ring even for me personally. So still trying to even process it myself, but it's such a true fact. There's, I don't know why, like you mentioned, maybe it's because of being a people pleaser or just generally not wanting to avoid conflict or whatever the case may be, but those conversations, because it's then it's almost as if, if you don't have those difficult conversations, like you mentioned, you bring the hurt to yourself because you're still, there's some sort of boundary, some sort of like, joining kind of tethering force you still have to that relationship because you never had that difficult conversation so i think this pandemic i hope at least at the very least it has been able to provide that type of environment that type of space to think you know what i have a better sense of what it is that are my core guiding principles and values and virtues and then i can bring that to the way i experience the world the way i relate to others and as I've gotten older, at least I've realized that, you know, some relationships come and go. You don't have any control over that. As people pleaser myself, I know like how much you want to keep those relationships very tight or 
you don't want to break them off completely and, you know, cause harm. But having those difficult conversations is also just as important as, you know, being able to bring yourself fully and authentically to more vulnerable conversations that are trying to bring together the bond closer as well. Absolutely. And I think uh, my grandma, my grandfather said something one time that, you know, they may not like what you have to say, but they'll respect you for it. And I think that that is so true, if, especially if we think about relationships, per, you know, per, personal relationships that may have gone on too long. You're doing a disservice to both you and that person by extending it, um, by, you know, breaking up with that person or, you know, distancing yourself from that person. Granted, you're having this conversation with them. You know, it, of course, it's going to hurt. But in the end, they'll respect you for, you know, doing it rather than delaying it. Um, at least that's what I've, I've seen in my personal life. No, that's true. That's true. How, how, how much more respectful it can be. Cause I think that also, if you can kind of think of it from that perspective and positively, like positively reframing it like that, maybe for people pleasers, it makes it a little bit easier to swallow. I think as much as it still will hurt to a certain extent, I think it's easier to swallow. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, 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 especially if we're coming back to like breaking up or any getting fired, like that, that's not going to feel good no matter who you are. I don't care if you're made of steel, that's still going to hurt. So, um, I'm just, I was tired of constantly living my life for, for others. At some point I needed to live my life for myself. And I know that, you know, that might, some people listening right now might think, well, that's really selfish, but I think sometimes there's this negative connotation with being selfish. I think that in healthy portions, I think it's 100% okay to be selfish because if you're not looking out for you, who is? Exactly. Exactly. And so I think this entire conversation, you know, today, Melissa has been such a great kind of jumping pad for folks to learn how to communicate better, to learn how to, I guess, be a little bit selfish in the way in which they're able to bring them f- their selves fully into the way in which they communicate with others and relate to others in both a personal and a professional setting, learning how not to compartmentalize things as much and try to live as ho- um, as full of an experience without you know feeling as if it's fragmented and you're trying to piecemeal things here and there being able to fully experience things without having to think of it as different arenas. And and so I think the strategies and tips that you were able to mention today of being mindful, learning to take on small incremental actions and and taking joy in those little wins can kind of help propel you towards being able to more fully and authentically find the way in which you can empower your voice, empower the way that you're able to communicate in, in, in a working setting with your coworkers, with clients, in your personal life, with a spouse, partner, friends, family, whatever the case may be. And so I'd love it, you know, if folks are interested in learning a little bit more about Appreciative Inquiry or even, you know, checking out your podcast, getting connected with you, how can they best, do, best get connected with you? So they can visit the Center for Appreciative Inquiry.net, which is, you'll see my profile there. But I encourage people, your listeners to visit Pivotal Moments HQ podcast, where we talk a lot about different topics on wellness and mindset. Communication has come up, boundary setting. So if they're interested in anything that we've talked about here, we, my co-host and I, we've delved in, into it on the podcast. Awesome. Yeah. And so I'll be linking all of those down below in the show notes, our description for the viewers. And so, Melissa, this has been such a great conversation. I, I wish we had more time and everything to you know, continue this conversation. But I think, you know, I think we're going to take this as a small little win as this conversation continues to be carried forward um, through, this, through this platform with Between Us. And so I'd love to leave some time here at the end for you to leave any other lasting messages that you'd like to share and impart with the audience. I just want to thank you for providing the space to talk about this. I think Now more than ever, people are wanting to authentically connect. And I don't know if that's just due to COVID. You know, when we talk about, you know, socially distance, I think people took that quite literally, not just with the six foot of distance, but also just, you know, not engaging with people like they they did. And, you know, being an introvert myself, I think that initially I was like, this is fine. I've been preparing for this my whole life. Um, But as weeks turned to months, which then, you know, as you know, like turned into a year, I'm missing that connection. And I think looking at the, the conversations we have, you know, how can we develop more authentic conversations, more meaningful conversations? 
um, I think is just such a crucial thing that humanity needs at this point. Um, I think that it conversations can serve as a sustainable life giving unit for people. So thank you so much for inviting me to the show. I had so much fun connecting with you and just sharing a little bit of what I know. Hey everyone, my name is Shaman Raman, and thanks for tuning in to my YouTube channel today. I hope you found this episode of the Between Us podcast enjoyable and that you're walking away feeling entertained, inspired, and or motivated. If you particularly enjoyed this episode, please go ahead and smash the like button down below and leave your thoughts in the comments section. And if you'd like to go ahead and keep up with the podcast, go ahead and follow our social media and please go ahead and subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell. So that way you can find out about new episodes as soon as they're released. Until next time, everyone, take care and we'll see you all in the next episode.